this is going to be interesting. So, thank you very much. Um, yeah, like like Manuel said, I'm not Yulu. Uh, I'm Sebastian Gold. I hope we get to see you talk uh, later during the program. But for now, I'm very happy to be here, and I'd like to thank first of all Manuel, Jean, Prague, and Shubo for organizing this very nice program and for getting so many cool people uh, here to Trieste. I've really been enjoying it so far. Uh, let me also start the timer. Is my microphone not on? Maybe. Is that okay? Is that better? Okay. Let me also get this off. Sorry. Okay. So um, yeah, like Manuel said, what I'm what I'm interested in is the theory of neural network. And in particular, what I'd like to understand is what do neural networks actually learn from their data? Okay. So in other words, what kind of features do they extract? Um, from their data set and, and what kind of features do they then use to, to classify their inputs, right? So this is a question about feature learning. And in some sense, this question is as old as, um, as deep learning itself. It's been with deep learning since the beginning. And one such beginning is, of course, uh, the famous AlexNet paper uh, from 2012, right? When, when Krzyzewski, Sutskever, and, and Hinton trained this deep convolutional network to win the ImageNet challenge. And if you look at that paper, it's actually quite an interesting read. They discuss how to distribute the training uh, across GPUs and all kinds of things. And then at the end, they actually show the filters that the network learned in the first layer at the end of training. Okay, and so this is the, the figure taken from that paper. And if you look at these filters and you're like a computer vision person or a neuroscientist, you're like, ah, this is, uh, I know these guys, right? These are, these are GABA filters. Um, so I guess the interesting observation here was that this combination of an interesting data set ImageNet, the convolutional architecture, and SGD as a sort of training algorithm gave you something that looks roughly like these GABA filters. Okay? But this approximately equal here is important because if you now think, you know, ah, I can just sub this first layer with the mathematical definition of a GABA filter and avoid some trainable parameters, you'll actually do worse. Okay? So there is something in the data um, that is really important here and that some of these filters have picked up. And so this is one of, these early, one of the early examples, I guess, also for this bitter lesson of deep learning, that somehow the features that we learn directly from data, if we manage to learn them, they're better than some kind of features that we would hand engineer using some domain knowledge. And this is an idea that's not just sort of prevalent in machine learning. It also appears in neuroscience, and actually it appeared in neuroscience quite a long time ago in the, in the form of efficient coding, right? So the, the filters, they are somehow adapted to the environmental stimuli. Um, but I'm not going to expand too much on this. Uh, instead, what I really want to focus on is, is you know, how do we learn these features? And, and in particular, how do the neural networks learn them? Um, and you know, in the title of the, of the talk um, was, the, you know, beyond the, the Gaussian world, because what we would like to do, of course, is we would like to have some kind of Gaussian theory, right? And um, what I'm going to argue is that, of course, to learn these filters in particular, the non-Gaussian fluctuations in the data are particularly important, okay? And here's a small um, example of that. So this is the test accuracy of a, of a dense net, that's one of those off-the-shelf uh, deep convolutional networks that people use in deep learning. And here I'm training it on Cypher 10, that's the standard uh, classification benchmark. And okay, you, you, you get this kind of learning curve and you go up to 80, 90%, okay, that's great. And now to test the impact of various sort of statistical properties of your data, we can construct clones of this data set. So for example, what we can do is we can construct a Gaussian clone. Okay, so this is a Gaussian mixture that's fitted Per, um, to, to the data set. So I have one Gaussian for each class. I fit the mean and the variance, and then I sample a new data set from that Gaussian clone. Okay? And I can now use that as a training set, train the neural network on it, and test it on Cypher 10 images. And this will tell me to what extent the mean and the covariance, so to what extent the first two cumulants of the data are important for this task. Okay? And if I do this, I get this curve. So what's maybe not so surprising is that there's a big gap at the end of, of training, right? So there's lots of filters here, uh, lots of information, the higher order cumulants of the data that my Gaussian mixture doesn't capture, and I pay for that uh, by a lower performance, okay? So this is just to highlight that the, you know, the non-Gaussian part of the data here is very important. A second observation, which is maybe not so, not so trivial, is that at the beginning of training, these two curves actually coincide, right? So for the first, I don't know, 10, 20 steps of training, for the network, at least in terms of its generalization performance, it doesn't make a difference whether you're looking at the Gaussians or the real images. And we'll come back to that um, a bit later. But yeah, so the observation is that these high order cumulants, they're important for generalization. This is true even in two layer networks. This is true even in the perceptron. I'll show an example later. But of course, we do not really have theory for that now. And so what I want to discuss in this talk is, is roughly three questions 
um, to make sort of a headway into, into this problem. So one is sort of how, dynamically speaking, do neural networks learn about these higher order cumulants? Um, how efficient are they? You know, if, if they're important, are neural networks a good method uh, to learn from them? And then finally, how do these higher order cumulants actually shape the neural representations, right? How do we end up with these, with these GABO filters uh, at the end? And I'll, I'll start with, with images and computer vision, and later I'll talk a little bit about natural language and, and transformers. Okay, so how do you learn about these, these, these higher order cumulants? So we saw here in this plot that somehow in the beginning of training, you know, whether you look at the Gaussians or the real images, doesn't make too much of a difference in terms of your, of your test error, right? And so we wanted to test sort of what happens in the middle here, right? Ideally, you know, we, we think about these as sort of uh, different approximations to the, to the Cypher 10 data set, and ideally we would like to have another approximation there in the middle. Something where maybe the first four cumulant are, are matched to Cypher 10 and the rest is zero. So the bad news here is that this is not possible. So there's a theorem that tells you that a distribution can either have one cumulant, two cumulants, or all of its cumulants. So as soon as you turn on this, this third cumulant, you turn on all of them. So we cannot play this nice structured game. You could do some kind of um, maximum entropy model, fixing the first few moments, sampling from that maybe. It's really tough. So it, what we did instead was a true, in the true deep learning spirit, we just took a neural network a generative neural network, and we trained it on Cypher 10. Okay, so in particular, we took a Wasserstein gun. Um, we took the Wasserstein gun because we wanted to make sure that the means and the covariance of the images match the true data. And for the true gun, that's actually quite hard. And then we trained the neural network on the images sampled from these scans. Okay? And when we test the network now on Cypher 10, you, you, get this, uh, you get this blue curve. And you can see that interestingly here, again, at the end of the day, you know, I'm losing something in terms of performance, right? The GAN doesn't capture all the information that's in the images. You can see that the images I sampled from the scan, they, they don't look great. But for the first 1,000 steps of training or something like this, the network doesn't seem to care, right? So for the first 1,000 steps, at least in terms of the test error, whether I train on the Wasserstein GAN images or on the real images, uh, it's the same story. And I can play this with different uh, models. Here's another data set sampled from a big diffusion model. And same story, these curves always, always collapse in time. So there seems to be some kind of ordering here, right? So the neural network, you know, it could have gone in any kind of way in time to, to learn about these statistics, but somehow it really seems to go through these in, in, in a certain order, right? It really seems to be learning distributions of increasing complexity through time. And this is a fairly robust um, observation. We made this, yes. No, that's why, I'm, that's why I emphasize sort of really from the point of view of the test error. So, no, you're absolutely right. This does not mean that the dynamics are exactly the same. Um, one thing, for example, we, we want to do is now look at the representations, you know, to what extent do they uh, correspond to each other. Uh, so this is really just in terms of the, of the test performance, which is, of course, in some sense, you know, the most important quantity. Also, let me just use that opportunity to encourage you all to, to ask some questions. I know we all just had lunch, so let's try to keep this as interactive. Uh, as possible, and oh God, I shouldn't have said that. Mark. So, I mean, I find that you have to have these other discussions because if you try to quantify. So, that's a good question, right? How do you quantify, in a sense, the distance in, 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 in distributions? I still do synthetic images. The model is much better. For me, so we discussed this quite a bit. For me, at the end of the day, um, the best test is, you know, how much do I learn from the Cypher 5 million or whatever images um, about Cypher 10? So for me, at the end of the day, the test error of this particular convolutional network, it's a good, it's a good proxy, right? There are ways of quantifying this, right? So in, in, in Yoshiyuki's talk, for example, he presented some of these measures that you have to just evaluate the quality of generative models. And on these measures, this, cipher, this diffusion model behind Cypher 5 million, it does much better. So if, uh, in terms of Freshnet fresh distance and all these things, it's a much bigger model. This is this WGAN, it's like five layers or something. It's one fair. Yeah. In the data, you mean? Yes, so for the, 
So for the Gaussian, for the, for, the, for the Markov random field, for the Gaussian, I assume stationarity, so I just sort of, I really just compute the mean of the covariance for each class, and then I plug that into the Gaussian. For the Gans and for the, for the generative models, I don't have that kind of control. The only thing I can control is that at least the mean and the covariance, they get it right, and actually that's not trivial. Often you get nice looking images, but statistically speaking, they're completely off. Uh, but I have no control anymore about the cumulant specifically. Okay. <laughs> this is great, keep it coming. Um, okay, so this is just a sort of experimental, observa experimental observation, right? So the question is now, of course, can we make this a bit more um, quantitative? And um, yeah, so let me say maybe quickly, so this is true, we tested this in, in, in a very variety of, of uh, architectures, also transformers, which handle images in a very different way from convolutional networks. They show roughly the same the same behavior there in the middle. What I also found interesting is we tested this with a network that was pre-trained on ImageNet. Okay, so now you have non-random, you could say, if I start from random weights, you know, I hit an image with a random set of weights, there's some strong CLT kind of uh, vibes uh, going on, right? So obviously, in the beginning, everything is Gaussian. With a pre-trained network, we get essentially exactly the same behavior. So here, this is pre-trained on ImageNet, this ResNet, and then we train the whole network end to end on Cypher 10. The training is much faster. So it's not the same data, that was kind of reassuring for us. But the, the sort of, the motions that the network goes to are the same. And so I think this actually raises some interesting questions about what do you actually learn when you do pre-training, right? There's lots of anthropomorphic intuitions about learning concepts that translate that kind of stuff. At least statistically speaking here, we, we don't really see much of that. Um, but it seems to be maybe more of an optimization issue, I don't know. Okay, so this is just an observation. Um, in, the, in the paper then, we also looked at this uh, from a bit more, more theoretical point of view. Uh, we looked at this in just a single neuron, a perceptron, okay, on a synthetic data set. Given the questions, I don't want to go into too much detail on this. Let me just say, so basically what we can do here is we can look at the gradient flow of this perceptron on this binary classification task. So all the dimensions are random. There's two-dimensional subspace in which the, the points actually have a meaningful uh, separation. And then you can basically compute the different classifiers that depend only on the mean, uh, that depend only on the mean and the covariance, that's called the Fisher discriminant, and you can compute the first sort of non-Gaussian correction to them, and they correspond exactly to states of the perceptron throughout time. Okay, so somehow also the perceptron goes to this learning of uh, distributions of increasing complexity, and I think the important observation here is also that the non-Gaussian statistics, they're important even when you have just a single neuron. Okay, so even for the simplest network, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it only looks at mean and covariance of the data. We can talk about that, uh, about that offline. But so, okay, so this first point was that at least, you know, empirically, neural networks seem to be going through this sort of very organized way of learning about the distribution of their data. The higher order cumulants are important. Now you can, of course, ask, okay, are neural networks actually a good method to learn from these, from these cumulants? Are they efficient in some, in some, in some sense, okay? And so um, this is some recent work that we've been doing where we thought about this question. And the way we thought about it is by reframing it as a, as a hypothesis test or as a classification task, right? So if I want to know, has my network learned about cumulants? What I can ask is, can it make the difference in the classification sense between images of, of horses, for example, and Gaussians that have the same mean and covariance? Um, so this is just the hypothesis test, right? I have some, some standard basic distribution Q, and then I compare some other distribution P, P2, and in this case, the distribution of forces. Of course, I cannot describe this, uh, this distribution of forces very well, so we resorted to looking at some, at some toy models. The way you do this um, is you look at the, the likelihood ratio, right? So this is very classical statistical testing. You compute the likelihood ratio. This is just really the, the ratio between the two distributions for continuous uh, random variables. And then um, you can use this classical result, and you can look at the norm of this likelihood ratio, okay? And this norm, you evaluate it over the, the simple distribution, so the Gaussian distribution. And if the second moment of this likelihood ratio, if this norm diverges as you go in the thermodynamic limit, you can distinguish the two distributions, okay? If it stays order one, you cannot, or at least not in polynomial time. No, actually, this is statistical statement, so you just cannot. Yeah, so this is um, my next slide. Exactly, because now the question is, of course, how do I model the P? I'm not going to model it with horses. Like, the, I can't do that yet. Um, so this is a statistical statement, right? This is about how much information is there in the distribution. Can I distinguish them? Of course, if we talk about neural networks, what we're interested in is, is an algorithmic distinction. So can we do this with a polynomial time 
algorithm, okay? And then there's some very nice ideas that appeared recently that sort of are inspired of this uh, sum of squares hierarchy. They first appeared in the PhD thesis of, of Sam Hopkins. And basically the, the idea here is to not look at the likelihood ratio, but instead to look at the projection of the likelihood ratio into a, a polynomial subspace, okay? So here we're gonna have a baseline distribution Q which is Gaussian, so the, the polynomials in which you expand are the Hermite polynomials. This is this, this projection. And you expand into all the polynomials of degree at most D. And then the statement is that, or the conjecture, it's, it's not proven yet, but it's proven right on many, uh, it's proved to make the right predictions on many models, is that if your P and Q are, are nice enough, and if your degree is sort of logarithmic in the input dimensions, if this low degree likelihood ratio stays bounded, there's no polynomial time algorithm that can distinguish these two distributions. Okay? So, very simple, but I think very nice idea of going from this information theoretic quantity to something that tells you something about a pretty wide class of algorithms, right? The, the key here is that the degree scales logarithmically with the input dimension, right? So, this means that spectral methods, these kind of things, they're covered um, by this framework. Uh, with probability one as you go to, to high dimensions. And there's a very nice review, if, you, if you're interested in this, that I recommend, from, from which I learned many of these things, uh, from, from Kuniski, Wein, and uh, Bandera. Okay, so what are the data models that we're gonna, that we're gonna use here for P? So, um, a lot of work in this framework has been done on these Gaussian additive models, okay? So, for example, you have some kind of spiked Wigner matrix, um, the review by, by Bandera, all they focus on that, so you have either a spiked Wigner matrix or you just observe uh, an unspiked matrix, you want to distinguish the two, right? So, these are data models that we've seen quite a few times um, already. Of course, here we have a square matrix, right? So, we want to extend this to a case where you have uh, n-dimensional samples, d-dimensional samples, and you have n of them. Right, so a natural Gaussian model to consider here would actually be a spiked Wishart model that we've seen uh, many times now. This morning, Manuel gave a very nice uh, introduction to it, right? So under P, you observe a data matrix where each vector comes from this uh, spiked Wishart model, and under Q, you observe white noise. And it, it's pretty easy to extend uh, the LDLR method to, to this model, and what you do is you recover the BVP transition, right? So in other words, these are distinguishable if the signal-to-noise ratio is bigger than, than the square root of the number of samples over D. Now we wanted to check, you know, we wanted to say something about learning non-Gaussian non fluctuations, right? And so we, we try to do sort of the, the smallest variation on the spike Wishart model um, that you can, and so we generate samples like this. So under P, you then observe such a data matrix, X, um, and now you generate these, these vectors, X, in, in two steps. So the first step looks a lot like a spike Wishart model, okay, W is still a Gaussian noise vector, but now the G, which would have been, which is just a scale and which would have been a Gaussian random variable in the spike Wishart, we draw it from something that's non-Gaussian. So you can, you can make your pick, you can draw it from a Radamacher, you can draw it from a Laplace, anything that's non-Gaussian is, is nice. And this just means that now my, my X mu is, is, is non-Gaussian, okay, I have non-zero non cumulants. But of course, you know, if you match the mean and the variance of the Laplace, to the Gaussian. You can still just look at the covariance matrix and the simple spectral method is, is all you need, right? So what we're gonna do in the second step is we're gonna whiten the data. Okay, so it turns out in this model you can actually compute the square root of the covariance uh, with, with a couple of lines. And so our axis will be the whitened um, inputs from this spike cumulant model. So in other words, this is now a data set which has a spike in the fourth order cumulant, but if you just did a spectral method, if you just look at the covariance matrix, it looks completely isotropic. This is the, the P that we're gonna use, okay? And then, okay, you can deploy the, the LDLR tool set, and this is, um, yeah, then you can ask, okay, so how many samples do you need to distinguish the two um, distributions? And then you can deploy the LDLR tool set, and um, Lorenzo did, did, did the heavy lifting here, and he's got a poster on this. Um, but basically what, what Lorenzo found is that you can bound, you have, we have matching bounds on this, on this likelihood uh, degree ratio, they look a bit um, forbidding, but what they basically tell you is that the likelihood ratio, it's gonna diverge if you have quadratic sample complexity. Okay, so contrary to the spiked Wishart, uh, you now need sort of a number of samples that's quadratic in the, in the input dimension. If you have something that's smaller than that, you're not gonna be able to distinguish the two, right? And on the one hand, this makes sense because um, you're now estimating things from a fourth order 
cumulant. On the other hand, of course, you could say, well, I'm still, I just need to estimate one, num one, one vector, right? I just need to estimate this, this vector u, right? Um, but what the likelihood degree ratio tells you here is that you need a number of samples that's quadratic in the input dimension. I see two, so I think Bruno and then Marco. If I understand correctly, this is from the perspective, like information theoretic perspective, right? Not really, right? This is more from the, so the information theoretic perspective would be you look at the likelihood ratio. Mm -hmm. This is actually much harder to compute okay. um, because we now have, no, we don't have a closed expression for the distribution of P. So this is about polynomial time algorithms. So this is a computational yes, state. I'm trying to connect this to the original metric that I introduced in the first slide, which is performance. And when it comes to performance, I think that will depend on the task, right? Because for example, we can show that in a, in a, in a spiked model, like a Gaussian mixture, uh, the performance is a completely equivalent to a Gaussian from the perspective of perceptron. But yeah. it depends on, of course, how the means correlate with the process that generated the data, yeah. even above the BBP. Yeah, that's okay. true. So respect to at least performance, it might still have like Gaussian performance, depending on how you are labeling this data, right? Yeah. The important thing here is that there's nothing in the second order statistics that help you do the task if you think about it as a task, right? So here, the, the, the key thing is that you've, you've forced the network or whoever's doing the test, you need to look at the cumulus because that's the first information carrying sort of uh, statistic. But indeed, the, com the comparison to neural networks is actually subtle and uh, we, can, we can talk about it offline. Okay, Very thanks. Marco, I think, was next in there. Oh, you want to talk? Just a clarification. If here you do the, this whitening to the case where G is Gaussian. Then you, there's nothing. Left. There's nothing left. Yeah. If G's got, I mean. Okay. I mean, mine is much more mundane. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to understand exactly the model. So, um, so W is G in its matrix. So here I'm writing it for one one vector sample, right? So uh -huh. W is a, is a Gaussian noise vector. Okay. You can. So this is exactly the spike. That if G in mu is Gaussian. Yes, yeah, so I'm this is exactly trying the spike vision. to understand exactly what's Laplace. So you're changing the prior of the signal, so I don't quite understand. No, sorry, what's, so you, so there's the prior of the, of the spike of the signal, which I'm huh? not specifying. Okay, so let's say uniform on the sphere. Uniform distributed, yeah. The prior that I'm changing is the prior over the scalar variables G, which I'm never trying to reconstruct. So that's the SNR, no. That's related to the SNR, but here I'm doing it in such a way that uh, mm, the Laplace still has mean zero and variance one. What I'm really changing is I'm turning on the cumulant. By changing the distribution of G, I make it. I, I don't see the connection to the BBP also in the other case. So in the BBP, I would think, so I get a matrix, and the matrix is something like lambda UU transpose plus GOE. I mean, exactly. In the, in the, in the spike Vichat now, yes. if, you, if you take the covariance of the yes. average covariance of this thing, right? Yes. The variance of G mu is, is, is the IID, it's one, uh -huh. this goes away. So you get the usual beta over D UUT plus GOE. So I, I don't see how you pass from the matrix formulation to the vector formulation of X mu. That's the bit that I'm missing. Ah, okay, this is a, okay. Uh, it's just a way of, of writing. I, I like to think about sort of how I sample these things, and so, but they're completely equivalent. Okay. But One. if I were to write again the matrix formulation for the case in which Laplace, yeah. how would it look like? Well, so, the, so I don't have a closed form for the distribution. Okay, so it's less natural to write it that way. Okay. Exactly, that's, that's why sort of okay. if you want to go this route, it's easier to write as a vector. Thanks. Any other questions on this, on this model? I'm happy to discuss this more. I think there's many other questions um, that, that, you know, that we can ask you that, that, that are fun and we have some, yeah, we have some questions. I have some questions at least, so I'm, I'm happy to discuss more the next two weeks. Okay, for well, now I don't see any. Let me just check the time quickly, okay. Um, yeah, so, but of, what we wanted to connect this, of course, is, is the performance of, of, of neural networks, right? And so, like I said, there are some subtleties now in how to go from this um, hypothesis test in, in, with a polynomial time algorithm to the performance of neural networks. I'm happy to discuss sort of um, offline, but um, what I can tell you is that together with Esther, who's also got a poster here, um, Esther's done many sort of careful simulations where you basically just tried um, neural networks on these kind of classification tasks. So here, for example, we tried them on, these, on this model of images. I'll, I'll show how that works a bit later, but this, it's the same idea. You have some data which is not Gaussian and you compare it to its Gaussian clone. And in particular, what we wanted to know is, you know, back to this efficiency question, 
Do you need neural networks for that? Could the kernel, could the lazy method do this um, just as well? And the, the, the quick answer is that no. So here, for example, I'm showing you the test accuracy um, as a function of the training set size, right? So um, again, for small training sets, there's, there's nothing that either method picks up here. But then as I increase the data set size, there's sort of a very sharp transition. Uh, the neural network suddenly picks up something um, in, in the data and the, the lazy methods, so in this case, the, the random features don't do anything. Okay? And even if we sort of go a bit further, the random features at some point, they will start picking up something, but okay, they will, they will have a much lower performance and, and it will take them sort of a lot of data to, to get to, to a decent, decent performance. You can do this also a bit more carefully. You can look at this sort of by really interpolating between the neural networks and the lazy regime using this alpha trick that we learned from Linnaeus Shiza and you get the same story, right? So as I sort of go from the feature learning regime to the lazy regime, my transition to where I pick up the structure, it goes further and further out, okay? And, um, and later on, I'll show you what exactly the data changes that the neural networks then, then pick up, okay? So yeah, all of this to say is that neural networks are efficient at learning from these higher order cumulants, at least, you know, as long as you compare them to these linearized neural networks to these kernel, kernel methods. But now, of course, okay, what we really want to know is we want to, we want to understand feature learning, right? We want to know representation learning. So how do these cumulants actually shape uh, the representations that the neural networks picks up, okay? So to, to do this, let's look at another, um, let's, let's look at another data model. It's the last data, no, it's the next to last. We'll see. Uh, this is joint work with Alessandro uh, Ingrosso, who's here at um, ICTP. And with Alessandro, we were interested in sort of questions around learning convolutions, learning from, from images. And so we, we wanted to have a good model for images. In fact, we wanted to have a minimal model for images. Okay. So then you can ask, okay, what, what does that mean? What do you need? Right? And so one very basic thing that we started from was this idea of translation invariance. Right? Images are roughly translation invariant. That's why convolutional networks are a good idea when you're dealing with images. So okay, let's start with something that's translation invariant. And because we're, you know, with statistical physicists, let's start with some Gaussians, okay? So we have a Gaussian process, mean zero, and then the covariance is translation invariance in the sense that the covariance between any two pixels, it only depends on the relative distance between them, okay? There's one free parameter in this model, it's the correlation length between, between the pixels. It's very easy to sample from this, and the, the samples, the images that you sample from this, they look like that. They look nothing like images. In particular, they have this typical Gaussian process thing where they're very blurry. But there's actually a lot of discussion, especially in the, in the neuroscience literature, if you go back to, to papers from the late 80s, the 90s, uh, where they think about you know, what actually makes an image an image, and one thing that comes up repeatedly is this idea of edges. Okay, edges are really important, sudden changes in, in luminosity, exactly the thing that the Gaussian is missing. So how do we get edges in these, in these images? Um, we're gonna put them through a, non, a, a saturating nonlinearity. Okay, so very simple point-wise nonlinearity. Here we're using the, the error function, and we're going to control the slope of this error function using this little parameter g. Apologies, it has nothing to do with the g that we just talked about. Uh, but okay, we have this little gain factor g that controls the slope of the 10h around zero, right? And what that will do is it will control the, um, the sharpness of the edges in my image, right? And so as you increase the gain, you make the, the slope steeper, and you get these, these images which look, look a lot like, you know, a bit like sort of a poor man's uh, Ising model samples, right? And of course, they have the same mean and covariance as an Ising model, right? That's why we chose this covariance. Statistically speaking, what you do as you make the edges sharper is you increase the relative importance of these higher order cumulants, right? And we'll see why that, why that is important in a second. So what we can do now is we can train a neural network on, on data sampled from this model. Like I said, we have one free parameter, so let's do a task where, you know, we want to distinguish images that have short range correlations from images with with long-range correlations. And we did this with sort of a standard vanilla, two-layer, fully connected neural network. And if you do that, you, you, you get pretty good accuracy. And then what you can do is you can actually look at, at the weights in the first layer that you learn, okay, at the features, right? This is a fully connected network, features, weights, they're the same thing. And what you find is weights that look like this, okay? So your neurons roughly split into two groups, and half of them look like the weight vectors that I've plotted here on the, on the bottom. Uh, we call them oscillatory, but really, I mean, they, they don't look like anything in particular. They're important, though. You can't just prune them away. The network somehow relies on them. What we were kind of excited to find is that, on the other hand, the other half of the neurons, roughly, it has this very particular weight, uh, which is localized in space, right? So the dark blue pixels each correspond to one weight, and they're almost all zero, except for one blob, you know, um, which, is, which is very much non-zero. 
So in other words, here we have a localization in the weights. Actually, if you look a bit closer, you can see that you've kind of learned a convolution with a single filter, which is kind of interesting from a machine learning point of view, but okay, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this today. If instead I trained my network on the Gaussian clone of this task, okay, so if I train on a Gaussian mixture with the same correlation length, uh, I find weights that look like this. Okay, so again, I have these sort of high frequency oscillations, and then the other half of my neurons, they actually look a little bit like sinusoidal waves. And indeed they are, and if you think a little bit about it, this, this makes sense, because what you're looking at here is, um, you know, a correla correlation covariance matrix, which is circulant, so its basis is the Fourier basis, so what you're doing is PCA. But what we wanted to understand is, okay, where does this localization come from? Where, why do you learn this localized, localized thing here? So we thought a bit about sort of Gaussian equivalent models, um, but unfortunately, this is a regime where these Gaussian equivalent models, uh, their magic breaks down, right? So what I'm showing you here is um, in green, it's a measure of the localization of these receptive fields over time, okay? And you can see that in the beginning of training, nothing happens, and then there's sort of a transition in, in how localized they are, okay? And statistically speaking, the, the flip side of this localization of the weight is that the statistics of the pre-activation changes, okay? So the pre-activation, that's just the scalar value that you get from dotting your input with your weight, okay? That's what goes into the hidden neurons, and then you apply the nonlinearity. And if you plot the kurtosis of this, um, of this distribution, right, you can see that in the beginning it's, it's close to zero, the excess kurtosis, and then it rapidly decreases. So the distribution of pre-activation suddenly becomes very non-Gaussian, just at the same time as this localization happens, okay? So the bad news is that, okay, this means that we, we, we can't use these Gaussian equivalent uh, tricks here, but this is also hinting at something interesting, right? So there's something going on here um, in the, in the non-Gaussian fluctuations which might, be, which might be worth checking out. And so, does this make sense? Maybe I should pause here for a second. Uh, does this make sense? What we're observing, what we're doing, what we're trying to do. Okay, I don't see any immediate questions. Um, so yeah, what we want to understand is, okay, where do we get these localized weights from, right? So what's the signal in the data that tells my neural network, actually for this task, you want to be convolutional? And so again, to, to analyze this, we went back to the simplest model that we could think of, just a single neuron, uh, perceptron, and we again look at the gradient flow of that uh, network trained on this type of data, okay? And in particular, uh, we just expand the, the loss here up to third order in the weights. So the second order drops out because there's a point symmetry in the data, so for symmetry reason, this just goes away. So these are the first two terms as I expand my, my gradient flow. Okay, and so what I get here in terms of the data statistics that come in, it's I get two pixel correlations and four pixel correlations. And so now if I want to understand, you know, what is the impact of the non-Gaussian statistics, I can reshuffle this thing, and I can rewrite this in terms of covariance matrices and, and the cumulus, right? So in terms of a Gaussian contribution and the and the non-Gaussian distribution. And so I get this sort of uh, gradient flow. If I just integrate the Gaussian part, I get this oscillating weight, right? So there's the signal for the localization, it comes from this non-Gaussian part, from the cumulant. So let's look at that a bit more, more closely. What can you do with such a cumulant? It's a, it's a fourth order tensor, right? So we saw that the neural network on the Gaussian data was doing some kind of PCA. So let's do something similar for the cumulants, okay? Let's do a decomposition, a tensor decomposition into a sum of outer products of vectors. Okay, so this is just a generalization of the spectral theorem to the tensors. There's actually lots of, lots of things you lose, which are nice about the spectral theorem, but you can still do this decomposition. This is a symmetric tensor. You have some guarantees that this thing at least exists. And then you can look at what do they look like, these, these eigenvectors of the cumulant, okay? And if you have, I call it blurry images. So if you have non-Gaussian inputs, but the gain is small, you know, there's a little bit of edges, but not really, you get CP factors or eigenvectors which look like these gray lines, okay? So they're a bit of a mess, they're all over the place, don't have any particular structure. And likewise, the weight of the perceptron is also a bit all over the place. This is the blue line at the end of integrating this gradient flow. But then as I increase the gain, as I make my data more non-Gaussian, as I make the edges sharper, something interesting happens. My eigenvectors localize in space. There seems to be a sudden uh, transition here. And that's important because as the CP factors of my cumulant localizes, so does the weight. So clearly the weight is picking up something here in this, in this cumulant and it's actually just following some kind of attractor dynamic to one of those CP factors, okay? Why is it doing that? Because it actually does a bit better if it's trained on the non-Gaussian data than on the Gaussian data. 
right? So this is, again, it's relevant to the task here to exploit these cumulants, and so the perceptron does it, even though it's a very simple, it's a very simple model. Okay. Now, this is a purely numerical characterization, right? You compute these tensors, you, you compute this tensor decomposition. It's a bit of a pain. But um, what I find interesting is uh, I'd really like to understand this, this transition a bit better, right? Because, you know, we've, there's a very rich mathematics around this, this random covariance matrices, no BBP transitions, all these, these kind of things. And here we're seeing something that's a little bit reminiscent of that at the level of this random cumulant, okay? So in particular here, we're plotting, um, and this is really a heroic effort by, by, by Alessandro, who did these uh, numerics um, on the classes of Columbia University. Thank you very much. Uh, where we plot sort of the, how localized are the CP factors that you get from these matrices as a function of the number of inputs that you have, right? So this is, again, thinking about this in terms of the sample complexity, right? I can only detect that there is something in the cumulants here that goes beyond just what you would get from a finite data set uh, of, of, of Gaussians, right? And there seems to be a pretty sharp crossover, okay? Here we're plotting it for historical reasons uh, and, the, and the referees as a function of linear sample complexity, so as a function of number of inputs over dimension. This is clearly not the right scaling for, for cumulants. You can see that not only does the transition get sharp, it also moves to the right, right? So this is, this is bad. Um, but yeah, something I'd like to discuss uh, this, uh, a bit more is to what extent can we actually capture what's, 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 what's going on here in a bit more mathematical terms, you know? And you wanted us to suggest some, some open problems, you know? And I think, yeah, this is something that I'd like to understand a bit better. And if we can discuss this over the next two weeks, that would be, that would be fantastic. Any questions on this? No, I've completely lost it. Yes, thank you. Say again. So the question is, what's, what's on the y-axis? Yeah, I didn't see that very clearly, I'm sorry. So what we're measuring here is how localized is this weight vector, right? You remember, um, if you have little samples or little signal-to-noise ratio, sorry, uh, the CP factors are all over the place, they're oscillating or something like this, then they get very localized. And so what we're measuring here is the inverse participation ratio. It's kind of, a, you know, sum over the four elements to the fourth power divided by element, sum over the square square. It's something that people use also, you know, in, in, I don't know, quantum mechanics to measure, like, localization, these kind of things. Yeah. It moves. I hope that, no, I think so, again, so for historical reason, we plotted this as a function of linear, so the question was the impact of dimension here, right? And the observation is that the transition or the crossover, it moves to the right. Of course, if you wanted to look for a phase transition, you want something that is at fixed. Clearly, the scaling here is wrong, right? This is not a linear sample complexity kind of effect. We had to plot it like this for, yeah, historical reasons. Um, but no, I think clearly also the LDLR would suggest that probably a quadratic scaling is the right one here. Uh, yeah. No, ideally, you want these curves to collapse, of course, yeah. Great. So, yeah. Um, let me see with time. So I still have a couple of minutes. So I guess the interesting thing... Okay, great. Um, so I guess the interesting thing is that there seems to be this sort of interesting way of thinking about your data, right? So where does this localization come from? Comes from? It comes from the symmetry that we put into the problem, right? The data is translation invariant. And if it's translation invariant, this has a certain effect on the higher order cumulants. It localizes its CP factors. And this is something that neural networks seem to care about. Right, so the representations then depend on these, on these higher order cumulants. So I think there's lots of things you can, you can do here. You can look at, at, different, at different symmetries, right? I think it's also interesting that this system looks sort of localized at the level of the cumulant, but delocalized on the level of the covariance. Okay. So for images, there's lots of, of questions here. So let me spend the last couple of minutes to, to think a bit out loud about to what extent can we actually extend this approach um, of thinking about data symmetries, cumulants, and, and representations to other data modalities, okay? And of course, if I, if I say other data modalities here, um, given what's been going on in deep learning in the last few years, what I have in mind is natural language, right? I mean, this has been the biggest uh, sort of breakthrough in, in, in machine learning, I think, in the last couple of years. I guess all of us have used ChatGPT to some extent in the recent past. Oh, I also see that my laptop is about to die, sorry. So, yeah, the question is now, what does a transformer learn from a statistical point of view, okay? So, like I said, transformers are sort of state-of-the-art in many 
in many domains now, but we want to know, okay, what do they actually learn? Again, from the statistical um, point of view. And I think an important point to consider here is that if you train these transformers, you usually train them not on the final task, not on the translation that you want to do at the end, but you train them in the sort of semi-supervised way, right? So you show them, in the, in the case of text, for example, you show them a sentence, you split it up into tokens, you hide one of those tokens, and then you ask the, 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 the transformer to predict that missing token. Right, there's this mass language modeling task, and GPT is actually called GPT because it stands for Generative Pre-Training, a transformer, something like that. Okay. So this is self-supervised. This is great because it allows you to leverage on, on, the, on the massive amounts of text that there are um, on the internet. Right? But so what do, you, what do you learn if you do this kind of procedure? What do you learn if you do this kind of procedure with a transformer? So let's focus on a single layer of, of self-attention. This is kind of the sing simplest transformer that you can think of, right? A transformer is a sequence of self-attention and MLPs that you stack on, on top of each other. So let's focus on just one of those layers of self-attention. That's akin to fo focusing on one convolutional layer in a convolutional neural network, right? So what this network does is it takes the tokens, it maps them into a vector, and then it adds to each vector something that's called a positional encoding. That's just another vector that hard codes where in the sequence was this token. Okay, so the Ps are fixed, the E's depend on the words. They will change for each sentence. And then you get this set of vectors, and what you want to predict now is a new sequence of vectors. Or maybe you want to predict just another vector for the missing masked word. Okay? And the way the um, transformer does it is by first computing a linear transformation of these input. That's called the values. Okay? It's just a linear matrix multiplication. And then each predicted output token will be a linear combination of these values. Okay, and the, the matrix that contains the coefficients of this linear combination, it's called the attention matrix. Okay, so you have this attention matrix, and then my, my i-th output token, it's gonna be a sum over, you know, these values with the coefficients that come from the i-th row of this attention matrix. Okay, so it's a very simple uh, procedure. It looks a lot like a sort of non-parametric um, kernel retrogression or nearest neighbor kind of prediction algorithm. The way that you compute this attention matrix, usually is you do two more um, linear projections of your data, those are the keys and the queries, and then you just dot them together. Right? So in other words, you could have just done a self-similarity, you could have just taken the overlap of each of these inputs, but then you wouldn't have any tra trainable parameters. Okay? So this is what the, the single layer of self-attention does. It's a fairly simple transformation. And so again, to understand sort of what do you learn from this, we trained these um, on, on synthetic data. Okay? And so in particular, we thought about, you know, you have a finite vocabulary, so you want to have spins that take a finite set of values, so POTS model would be a natural, um, natural model for this kind of data, right? And then you get, um, forget about the V for, for a second, you get this kind of Hamiltonian, right? You have an interaction over the places on the sequence Jij. But in the POTS model, each of the spins, or each of the spin values, they're orthogonal to each other. For language, it's kind of a poor model, right? Because different vectors representing different words, they will have different degrees of similarity, right? Some words really mean completely different things. Some are semantically related. So we introduced this V vector to, a uh, V matrix, sorry, to encode the overlap between the different words. You can think of that as some kind of similarity measure between the words. And, um, okay, let me go through, quickly through this. If you generate data from this kind of model and you train a standard transformer on this, it's kind of a struggle, so this is one layer, um, this is three layers, this is always on this prediction task, right? Because this is a POTS model, we can actually compute the conditional distribution of a single spin, so we know what's the best possible um, prediction here. We can actually do a lot of progress by rearranging the attention mechanism a little bit, okay? So we can rearrange the attention so that the coefficients only depend on the position in the sequence, okay? And the values depend only on the, on the word meanings. Okay, so we're decoupling the positions and the inputs. And if you do that, um, you learn this thing in, in no time. This is this factor of self-attention. Now, this is not uh, some kind of uh, magic. It actually makes a lot of sense if you, if you think about it a little bit, because you realize that this um, factor of self-attention now has the same form, functional form, as the conditional distribution of one spin given all the others in the POTS model. Okay? And indeed, you know, there's a huge community in statistical physics that's been looking at learning inverse Ising model, inverse POTS uh, models, and so on. And it turns out that training the single layer of self-attention with this mass language modeling loss, it's something that in the inverse Ising model, it's, it's, it's well known. It's just the pseudo-likelihood for the inverse POTS model. Okay? 
And you know, th these are just a couple of references. Um, this is a, a very established method. Right? Of course, nobody thought that by just stacking some of these layers, you, you get the kind of performance that you get with transformers. But I still think in terms of just understanding what one layer of self-attention does, it's quite a useful, quite a useful mapping. This is something that actually works on real data too. Um, people have seen this work well in, in protein prediction, uh, in computer vision, so, so this is nice. We did some replicas on this. I understand that uh, Federica already talked a little bit about this. I should say that Ricardo has a poster on this. And yeah, Federica already talked about this um, in her talk. They did the heavy lifting here on the, on the replica analysis. And, and, and so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that at this point. Let me finish with uh, one, more, one last slide. Okay. So, um, if you remember, the very first thing I showed you was this learning of distributions of increasing complexity of the, of the image models, right? So going through the motions, learning a Gaussian model of your data first, and then going up the, the hierarchy of, of generative models, right? And so what you can ask now is, 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 does this kind of ordering also apply up here in the transformer, okay? And so here I just want to give a little sort of preview. This is work that we're doing at the moment with, again, Ricardo, Federica and Alessandro Lai, who's also at CISA. So the natural question is to ask now, of course, what do you learn with like a deep transformer, right? What happens if I now stack layers of self-attention, right? If you want to analyze that, you want to analyze, of course, a richer data model. So a natural extension here is some kind of P-spin where you have pairwise interactions uh, like we had before, but now you also have, you know, triplet interaction, quadruple, and, and so on. And so what we did is we went up to, I think, fourth order. We, we, we sampled from this fourth order data set, and then we trained a transformer with, with three layers and with two layers on that kind of data, okay? And the kind of plots that you see, um, they look like this, okay? So the blue, the green, and the violet line, I guess, they're the error that you get from fitting just the best two, three, four body approximation to this kind of data, okay? The orange line is what you get from training this deep transformer, and again, I was very happy to see this. The transformer seems again to be going about this business in a very systematic way, right? So you first learn the two-body approximations, then you, you, know, you wait a little bit, actually quite a bit, and you learn the best three-body approximation and then the best four-body approximation and so on. So again, there seems to be an ordering in, in the learning of the, of the neural network, trained with stochastic gradient descent, on a very different type of task with a different type of architecture. But again, there seems to be some kind of systematic ordering here. Okay. Again, it's not trivial that you would exactly hit these kind of plateaus, right? You could go about this in any kind of which way. So there is some, some convergence in terms of the themes here. I'm, again, I'm happy to talk about this more offline. All right, I should conclude. So I started with this question, what do neural networks actually learn from their data, right? And so the argument that I tried to make is that the higher order statistics that there are in, this data, in these data sets, they're actually very important if we want to understand this this type of uh, feature learning, right? Um, and there seems to be some common motifs emerging here in very different data modalities, very different architectures, very different tasks, right? One of them, I think, is this idea that there is some kind of order in which you, you scoop up these, this, this information. Right? There seems to be some kind of ordering, uh, both in the language and in the vision. And neural networks seem to be good at this compared to other methods. Um, there's something about non-Gaussianity here, looking for non-Gaussian projections of your data. Um, and so, yeah, I want to, uh, investigate these a bit more in the future. And then finally, I think there's an interesting interplay, you know, once you've understood this, where you can think about what kind of data symmetries are there, how do those affect the cumulants, and how do those then show up in the, in the representations, right? So one natural question is now to ask, okay, what do these many-body interactions look like if, you, if you're looking at language, right? What are their features? What, do, what happens if I decompose them? Okay, so this is just a shout out to the, to the people who, who did all of this work. Uh, I mentioned Lorenzo Federica. Uh, Alessandro Laio was uh, part of this transformer project from day one. Alessandro Ingosso just appeared uh, at the back there. Um, Will Redmond did some nice work on, on real data that I didn't get a chance to, to talk about. Maria worked on the perceptron in distributions of increasing complexity. And Esther did a lot of analysis on the neural networks for the hypothesis testing. Thank you very much. Oh, and this is the view from CESA, by the way. I should, uh, I should mention that. Okay. Are there any questions? Thanks, Sebastian. It's, it's, it's a really cool line of work of research. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
many of your analyses are in the online learning setting, right, where time is identified with samples. Yeah. And I wonder with this uh, high order cumulant business, whether if you would actually see, re-see many times the data using mini batch and all that, would this actually help extracting this, this uh, information faster because you, you exploit correlations maybe in a smart way and I wonder how much would that affect uh, this overall picture? That's a really good question. Um, and, the, and the quick answer is I don't know. Of course, you know, the experiment that I showed you on, on Cypher 10, also the experiment that I showed you at the end there with the um, POTS model, they're actually done on finite data sets. And, and I agree, I think that going through the batches again will have some non-trivial effect, right? But you, it's very hard to analyze SGD on these, uh, when, you know, the correlations that you get from revisiting samples, they're really hard to handle. So I don't really know how to go about this, uh, about this business. Right? Even, even empirically, I was curious to, to know whether if you think it helps or... I mean, empirically, it's kind of funny, um, because I always think I say this because I'm very biased, because I obviously like online learning, right? But I think empirically speaking, actually, the online learning regime is now the relevant regime. Like these large language models, they actually never see the same data point twice. Because they're trained, I mean, the data is just so enormous um, that they do one epoch, and that's it. Maybe they do two. And it's actually really funny because, you know, these, these whole stories of, you know, has the network converted or not that were a big deal when you were looking at these computer vision models. In, in language models, they don't even care. They don't even train until convergence anymore. The, the loss curve goes like that, and then at some point they stop because, you know, it's been two weeks and they need to move on, you know? Um, so I think, actually, practically speaking, the online learning regime is pretty relevant, but I think from a theoretical point of view, it's a very interesting question. Any more questions? So these um, plateaus that you get, like learning data of increasing complexity, resembles a lot um, these kind of saddle-to-saddle uh, -saddle or staircase call, as you yeah. want, yeah. phenomena that you observe even with Gaussian data, which is related to you know staying in saddle points of the optimization landscape for long. Yeah. So I, would, I wanted to hear your thoughts whether you think here is the structure of the data that is generating some kind of structure in the landscape or, or is there something else out there? Um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting mix of the two, right? So of course, like in online learning, the, the, you know, the, the famous plateau of sudden solar, that's related to going from a linear model of your data to a nonlinear one, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to scoop up any sort of higher order cumulants of your data, you, you, you need to do that, right? So, you need to go through these kind of motions. But then I think, for example, in the POTS model, a big part of why we see the plateau so clearly is that um, the interactions matrices that we have, they're sums over, they're, they're, low, they're not low rank, but they're sums over outer products of, of vectors, and we give all of them the same coefficient. Right? So you, you sort of develop, you discover all of them at the same time. I think you could sort of mitigate these plateaus a little bit by just giving them different spectra, for lack of a better word. But they are data driven. I agree with that. Okay, thanks. When actually, if I may add one thing, when depth comes into play, there's also some interesting effects into, you know, to what extent does the network actually exploit its full depth? I didn't talk about that, but we can, we can chat. Hi, Seb. Hi. Nice talk. Hi. I don't know, in the case of adversarial attack, I don't know if, like, uh, we can use your approach to understand why the prediction is very wrong. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. But I was recently at um, I was recently discussing with uh, Julia Kempe, who's at NYU, and, and she's studying with her group uh, adversarial attacks a lot. And there is apparently a thing in adversarial attacks where early stopping helps in making the models more robust. Okay, and um, and so what they're testing now using these clones is this idea that maybe part of what makes you sort of um, brittle, or part of what makes you vulnerable against adversarial attacks, is related to when you scoop up these higher order fluctuations. So. I don't know, but I hope that they will find out soon. But it's a very good question, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, can you go back just to your last slide, I think? Yes. Uh, yeah, that one. that one. I really want yeah. to emphasize that the view from CESA is very nice. You know? <laughs> it's a bit further from the sea, but... Uh, I just, I, I noticed that um, it, it hits the first two kind of theoretical predictions, if you will, yeah. and then it, it skips below, and I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that, basically. Uh, actually, I didn't, but it's a very <laughs> good job from the last row. Um, yeah, it's true, there's a bit of a gap. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limp. I think this is just because we use too little data. Uh, we actually used, if 
fairly small data set uh, here, and I think that's just um, it's just related to that. I think if we if we have a bigger data set, uh, we'll match. Yeah. I, that would be consistent with the stuff that we ran into as well. So. Ah, okay. We, um, yeah, so I mean, you, you know Claudio Merga, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. So we were also trying to learn cumulants in a slightly, I mean, a different setup. Yeah. Uh, and the higher the cumulant, the more data you need. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. And you, exactly. you need, like, orders of magnitude, more data for, ah. for each new magnitude. Um, and I, as far as I recall, batches were not super helpful. You actually knew, yeah. need new data points. Well, I'm actually glad that you mentioned this, because I usually have a slide on the unsupervised stuff, and it's true that, that Claudia Merga and the group of Moritz Hellers, they, they have a very nice recent work, actually two, where they also look at sort of how the distribution of inputs changes as they propagate along the network. I thought that was quite interesting. And then Claudia has this work in unsupervised learning, you know, how can you sort of actually learn the elements of these higher order interaction tensors. So strongly recommend taking a look. You have another question, no? Unsupport vector machines, learning higher order kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I was discussing that paper with Bruno yesterday. Uh, so the question was, is there any connection to, to, to some of the older works um, looking at support vector machines using tools from statistical physics? Uh, I think there's actually a lot, of, a lot of connections. I think, you know, you, you guys found the, you know, um, the stepwise in the different regimes decrease of the, of the kernel that we sort of rediscovered in machine learning, right? I think it was a very nice paper. And I think, you know, the reason why, the, I showed you the kernels, right, doing so poorly on this, um, on this hypothesis testing task. It's exactly because of that, right? Because to estimate each moment, they'll need, you know, uh, another order of magnitude more data. And that's going to take forever. Or it's going to take a lot of data, and that's why they do so poorly on these tasks. So I think it's, it's very much related to that. Okay. There are no more questions. We thank you again, Sebastian. Thank you very much.